everybody doing? Yeah. Happy spring, finally. Um, my name is Christina Villarreal. You can know me as V. Second year doctoral student in the Social Studies Education Program and Research Assistant at UNI, Institute for Urban and Minority Education. Really honored and excited to welcome you to our UNI Spring Colloquia with one of the most um, important and transformative mentors in my life, Dr. Sean J. Knight. Um, also want to remind you that we have another colloquia this Wednesday um, with our post-doctoral um, fellow, uh, Dr. Monique Lane, uh, at 5 o'clock. Also, um, please join us after directly following the lecture in Grace Dodge 179 for a wine and cheese reception and conversations with Dr. Jim Wright. So the story of how this colloquia came to fruition uh, really begins in the fall semester. During one of our new staff meetings following the non-indictments, there was a tremendous sense of frustration, anger, heartbreak, and tension. And in some cases, I would say, at least on my end, a feeling of paralysis around how to respond to the post violent violence instances of state-sanctioned dehumanization. We were wrestling with how we were going to go about responding, resisting, and healing within the context of our respective work here at TC and in our communities at large. I vividly remember feeling the weight of the silence of the room, the pain of our collective frustration, and a borderline sense of hopelessness that was lingering in the air. It was in that moment that our leader, Dr. Morell, gently uh, but firmly interrupted the silence with a simple but deeply important question. He said, okay, so how do we respond? What will come next? He reminded us that the responses and resistance would look different across the spectrum of persistent struggle. The immediate response that came directly from my heart was, I think we need to bring Sean Jim right to speak. His work both conceptualizes and inspires hope and reminds us to believe in the capacity of our own humanity to engage in courageous acts of love, innovation, and transformation. So to lead our introduction of Dr. Jim Wright, I am honored to welcome UMI Director and Macy Professor of Education here at TC, Dr. Ernest Moreau. Good evening. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be quick because uh, Dr. Jenner promised me he was going to do church in here. Uh, so uh, I'm going to get out of his way in just a, just a second. But a couple of things that I think are really important, as V was saying, um, you know, we have been besieged by um, what one of my students in her dissertation in defense said today is a black hunting season. And um, we think about like, what to do, what's next. And there are a lot of ways that you can conceptualize that. What is next, right? What is next? Take it to the streets, righteous indignation, policy, all these sorts of things. And there are really important ways to think about what's next. Most of those are at the macro structural level. And Sean's work complements that. He's all about that. But it's, what's next in terms of um, these 14 and 15 year old young boys and girls who have to go to school every day, who have to kind of walk around in their own skin and thinking about what does it mean W.B. Du Bois said in 1903, the problem of the 20th century was the problem of color line. What does it mean to be a problem? What does it mean to be traumatized? What does it mean to be under attack? What does it mean to be the hunted? And this idea of um, a, a, a praxis is um, a pedagogy of healing. And so when he said, you know, we should bring Sean, I thought, this is important. Right? It, is a, it, 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 is, it is a counterinsurgency that is about the individual level. It is radical healing as pedagogy, as praxis. And I think that this is so important, um, not in lieu of taking to the streets, not in lieu of letters to congressmen and representatives and senators and those sorts of things, but what does it mean on a day-to-day -day basis to rehumanize and to heal our young people? And to see that as our responsibility, to see that as revolutionary action. And Sean's going to talk about his work. And Sean and I go way back to graduate school uh, into the 1990s. Yeah, when we both had hair and it was black. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he walks the walk. Um, and, and, and he certainly um, can talk the walk, too. And I just want to read a couple of words from his, from his powerful biography so you understand you know, what privilege it is for us to have him here. Sean Jenneret is a leading national expert on African American youth, youth activism, and youth development. He's Associate Professor of Education in the Africana Studies Department and Senior Research Associate for the Cesar Chavez Institute for Public Policy at San Francisco State University. 
1989, Dr. Jim Wright co-founded Leadership Excellence, Inc. with his friend Daniel Walker. Leadership Excellence is an innovative youth development agency located in Oakland, California that trains African-American youth to address pressing social and community problems. 2002, he also created the Research Collaborative on Youth Activism, a network of scholar activists who study, advocate, and support youth organizing efforts around the country. Dr. Jim Wright currently serves on the board of directors for the California Endowment with oversight of the $3 billion endowment to improve the health of California's underserved communities. Additionally, he serves on the board of directors for the Institute for Sustainable Economic, Educational, and Environmental Design, IC, in Oakland, California. In 1999, he received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. What? <laughs> Pretty decent institution. Um, his research examines the ways in which youth and urban communities navigate through the constraints of poverty and struggle to create equality and justice in their schools and community. He's author of numerous, numerous books, chapters, and articles. Um, most known for his books, Black in School, Afrocentric Reform, Black Youth and the Promise of Hip-Hop Culture. He's co-editor of Beyond Resistance, Youth Resistance and Community Change, New Democratic Possibilities for the Practice and Policy for America's Youth. 2010, he published Black Youth Rising, Activism and Radical Healing in Urban America. Please join me in giving a warm Teachers College welcome to <laughs> Methodology, and they talk about 
talk about the way in which you frame your question, or they'll talk about even the subject matter, uh, because it's not academic enough. Don't apologize for that, right? Because every time you apologize for it, you, re you renege on your contract for justice. Don't do that, right? The third thing I want to say, my own research, is that while, it is, while you are academics and while you are teachers, it is important, uh, as we said earlier today, to understand the master's tools. We don't have to use them, but we've got to know what they are. Okay? So as we do that in graduate school, it is important to understand it, but it's also important that we courageously seek to create other tools that we don't yet know exist. That requires a radical imagination about the solutions that we have. My students, I give them an assignment. See, this is not in the talk. I'm just talking right now. We ain't got started. One of my assignments that I give my students, we study, this whole, we study a lot of the problems that African American youth and Latino youth face in urban communities. And their assignment, their last assignment in the class, is to use their imagination to come up with a solution. That means I don't want to know what they read. I don't want to know what policies already exist. Because I firmly believe that if we only build solutions, from the knowledge base that we know, that we have, we in some ways reproduce the same damn problem. The solution to what we have does not yet exist. And so we have to be courageous about our imaginations and how to use that. And they come back to me and say, that's the most difficult assignment I've ever got. No one in, the, no one in college, no one at a university has ever asked me to use my imagination. But it is only our imagination that has allowed us to advance our way through justice. Right? It's only our imagination that has allowed us to courageously seek the kind of policies, the kind of strategies that we need to solve the most difficult problems. So if you are a faculty member here today, your job is to protect and provide shelter for your students, to courageously imagine and act in ways that are beneficial to our communities. Your job is to do your own research, but more importantly, your job is to provide shelter and provide cover for people who want to courageously study and act and engage and write and think in ways that are uncommon to a university like this. If you are a student, your job is to be courageous in your thinking and your imagination and not apologize for it. That's your job. If you are a student, I mean, if you are a principal, or if you're a teacher, your job is to stay relevant and stay connected to the issues that are facing our young people. So I say that as a way of introducing this idea of radical healing. Because unless we have the institutions, the organizations, the people that are aligned in ways that allow us to move forward, what we will end up with is an army of well-trained, intellectual, irrelevant scholarship. Yeah. That is not what we want. So, by way of introduction, I'd like to share with you a little story. Um, so, this story is, uh, this is actually a personal story. I, I, I really, uh, you know, I've studied youth my whole life. Um, I've dedicated my life in many ways to developing strategies and policies for supporting young people are mostly disconnected, primarily teenagers. But about five years ago, I faced something that I hadn't faced before, and that is raising my own son, who was 14, who was 14 at the time. And so, um, my son and I were deeply struggling. Right? We struggled with him listening to his damn dad. <laughs> he would always disagree no matter what I said to him. He would disagree with me. Um, he would argue with me. He would, he would get in arguments. So one night I asked him, I said, um, his name is Takai. He said, I said, son, go clean your room, man. Just go clean your room, man. I don't want to argue with you. Man. So he went away and he was in his room for a while. He did the music play. And I walked into his room and it was filthy. He's like, hey, son, I thought I asked you to clean your room. And he said something, and I said, man, I want you to clean your room. He did, he did something that he had never done to me before. He did 
did this. He's like, now y'all know what that means, right? <laughs> I don't know what that, maybe y'all don't know what that means. My 14 year old son looked me up and down, was like, please, right? Utter disrespect, right? It was a challenge. It was all of the things that I wasn't raised to do that. And so he had violated to me the ultimate disrespect in my household where I paid the bills in the morning and all that. So I knew that I couldn't do the same kinds of sanctions. I couldn't take his iPod. I couldn't take his Beats headphone. I couldn't tell him he couldn't just play with his video game. I had to do something just as egregious as the act that he had just given to me. <coughs> He's 14, man, so I'm not going to take off my belt, which is what my dad would have done. <laughs> so I was furious, man. So I said, just get in the car. Let's go for a ride. So we got in the car. It was about 1030 at night. And we're just riding, just driving. I was mad. I didn't know what I was saying. I was quiet. And so I'm a, I'm a biker. I ride on a bike. And so um, there is a road. Oakland is very urban, but not far from Oakland. It's called the East Bay Hills. And the East Bay Hills is all wilderness. There's trees and bushes and deer and raccoons and all, you know, just a few minutes away. And so I know this road because I ride it at least once or twice a week. And so we found ourselves at 10.30 at night on this road, quiet, silent. I pulled over to the side of the road. And I looked at my son and I said, look, if you don't listen to me tonight, we are not going to. We're literally not going to make it. He's like, yeah, whatever, man. Whatever, man. So I got out of the driver's seat, and I got into the passenger seat. He got out of the passenger seat, and I put him in the driver's seat in my car. At 14 years old, I said, if you don't listen to me, we're not going to make it home. What I need you to do is put your foot on the brakes with the car to drive. And he was like, oh, shit. But you're going to drive. <laughs> he said, that's right. So I asked him to. Put his foot on the brake, put it in the drive. I said, now I just need you to accelerate up to about 15 miles an hour. You accelerate up to 15 miles an hour. He's really nervous. He's 14 years old. He had never driven a car before. Now, this is in the East Bay Hills. It's dark. There's curves in the road. There's a cliff. There's cliffs. There's rocks. There's animals. And I know what he's about to see. Because, I, like I said, I've been down on this road many times before. And so, I said, don't get nervous if you see a deer come across or a raccoon come across the road. Don't, don't slam on the brakes. And sure enough, about 500 yards, a deer ran across the road. Got nervous. I said, now I need you to turn left. It's a sharp left turn ahead. We got up to the sharp left turn and turned left. I said, now there's a hill. I need you to accelerate up that hill to about 25 to 30 miles an hour. And he accelerated up the hill to about 25 to 30 miles an hour. I said, before we get to the top of the hill, sir, there's a cliff on the left-hand side. So I need you to slow down and take a sharp right-hand turn. So we got to the top of the hill, he saw the cliff, and he got scared, he took a sharp right-hand turn. He drifted down the hill. And for the next hour, he listened to everything I said. He did precisely what I asked him to do. <laughs> we got back to sort of the city. We got back to where we had it started. Well, and I said, son, uh, you know, you did something different tonight. You listened to me. You listened to everything I asked you to do. Why did you do that? What did you learn tonight? He said, well, I think I learned how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the right answer, right? What he did was he was able to see, he was able to listen to his father. And what I told him was, this world, just like your life, man, I know everything that's about to happen to you. I've been down this road physically and metaphorically many times before. You don't have to make the same mistakes that I made, and that I love you. And that what we did tonight was out of love. And it was out of a sense of courageous love that I am willing to do whatever it takes, even if it means that we don't make it tonight. I would have left this world knowing that I, it was an act of loving you. Courageous love. It's putting my life, our life, our well being on the line so that he would have better decision making. I think I'm not the only person that has that kind of courageous love, not only for my son, but for the young people we work with. 
I think many teachers, many um, people who work in youth development, many people who deeply care about young people have the same kind of love that I have for my son. That they're willing to put whatever it takes on the line. That they're willing to give kids their cell phone numbers. They, they're willing to call their moms. They're willing to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, to create a loving connection with young people. And so I share that story with you because in the book, Hope and Healing in, in Urban Education, it's looking at and examining the ways in which teachers, the ways in which activists are transforming the ways in which we even think about engagement, the ways in which we think about pedagogy, the ways in which we think about curriculum, the ways in which we think about policy. Because they're acting out of the heart. They're acting out of way, they're acting out of ways that are connected with young people that in some ways are not taught in graduate school. Sometimes they're not taught in the curriculum books or the theory books that we have. But they're embedded in their hearts and that they allow their hearts to speak to young people in ways that allow them to transform, trans, um, transform their lives. So the book <coughs> documents studies <coughs> and stories and case studies of profound ways in which policies and practices from the heart got young men, for example, we'll, I'll talk about one case study. Got young men who shoot each other, put guns down, pick up pencils. Not because I've asked you, but because I have a loving relationship with you in ways that you haven't had before. So this, this book, in many ways, tries to introduce a new conversation into the principles we have in, in education, the practices we use in our classrooms, and the policies that we enact, that we have that govern, that sometimes govern our schools and school systems. So, what I think we oftentimes misdiagnose in our students, sometimes misdiagnose even in our community organizations, is the ways in which, and the profound importance of building a sense of hope among young people. And oftentimes there's a, there's a miscarriage of hope in our schools. That we think that our schools are fundamentally places of learning. I'll say that again. We think that schools are fundamentally a place of learning. But I want to challenge that idea. That schools also should be fundamental places of hope building. What good is it to have a good education if you don't know what it's for? Paulo Freire teaches us that a critical consciousness is not just about knowledge, but it is about knowledge that's applied to a condition, to transform a condition. That's hope, man. So if we can rethink about, if we can rethink about the purpose of schools, are not simply learning spaces, the buildings which, in which learning occurs, but they're places that saturate young people with opportunities to hope. That's particularly important in an environment that fosters hopelessness. So my son introduced me to Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> So I tweeted, so y'all heard his last album? Yeah. Come on. King Kota? Yeah. 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 They both did that. All right. So Kendrick Lamar's, uh, well, his new album was brilliant. I, I said, Kendrick Lamar, thank you for saying it. Uh, his new album was brilliant. But this is his first album. Um, my son introduced me to this album. And my son amazingly said, Dad, you should take a look at this title. He kind of knows my work. He says, no. Good Kid, Mad City. And on this album, Kendrick Lamar takes us through one of his days, right? He illustrates what it is being a good kid in a mad city. He talks about charade, his challenges with his friends, the challenges of, of, of being, uh, navigating the police, and the challenges of his friends wanting to carry guns and shoot, other, shoot at other people. But he, a kid in a mad city. He talks about being exposed to drugs, right? People want him to drink, but he's a good kid in a mad city. And I think that Kendrick Lamar provides us with a framework to understand the condition that we're in. That there are good kids in America, in urban America, 
in mad cities. Kendrick Lamar's assumption about good kids in mad cities is also supported by um, a scores of research. Um, James Gabriel calls it social toxicity. He calls social, to the social, social toxicity are, is similar to physical toxins, right? That if you're exposed to lead paint and asbestos, over time, being exposed to these physical toxins, if you lived in this room like this, that over time you get sick, you get asthma, you get all kinds of things from being exposed to physical toxins. If you don't get healed from the exposure to those physical toxins, the company can become legal. James Galarino says, just like there are physical toxins, there are social equivalents to physical toxins. And the social equivalents to physical toxins are things like fear, uncertainty, shame, embarrassment, hopelessness that all threaten the capacity of young people living thriving and, and vibrant lives. Oftentimes, however, we are unaware of the social toxic environment and its consequences that it has, that it unleashes on the young people that we see in our schools and communities. So we ask ourselves, how might, you know, if we're working with young people who have a profound sense of hopelessness, that how relevant is the Pythagorean theorem? How relevant is uh, American history, the civil rights movement? How relevant is the knowledge that we've been trained to brilliantly deliver in fact, it's not relevant to their sense of purpose and goal. Second, James uh, Farmer used um, an interesting term that he calls structural violence. Okay? Structural violence, similar to social toxins. He suggests that structural violence is oftentimes when we think about the ways in which structures exist in our society, that most of the way in which our discourse talks about inequality is structural inequality. But he suggests that, structure, but that those structures also unleash violence or harm our, uh, <coughs> they harm young people in ways that destroy their sense of possibility. So it's not just the structure of opportunity, of unequal opportunity, but prolonged exposure to unequal opportunity fosters a sense of hopelessness. They damage pathways, they damage the ability for young people to see how they can actually achieve. So structural violence is an interesting term because it allows us to understand structural inequality, not simply black opportunities, but how inequality creates harm in communities and schools. So James Bolin, in his research, talks about uh, the ways in which hopelessness predicts many of the behaviors we see in schools. He talks about hopelessness as a predictor of violent behavior, as a predictor of fatalism, as a predictor of depression. And I just ran out of space, so I just used those three. But we can go on and on and on about what hopelessness will predict. And so if we understand that hopelessness, the sense of not having a future, has reverberating impacts on young people's behavior, on young people's actions, and young people's possibilities, then how is it, and what is it that we do as teachers, as educators, and researchers to foster and build those, that, that sense of hope? Now, I also think that students are the only ones who are exposed or, or are immune to this. Teachers themselves, how do teachers themselves who are hopeless foster a sense of hope? If you don't have hope yourself, if you've been forced to live and operate in toxic schools, Right? Schools where, uh, you know, that, that feel like juvenile halls. Right? And you're forced to, in, to actually abide by rules that you know damage young people. Right? I'm not going to call out any schools, but you know some, right? Where good teachers have to follow corrupt rules. Right? So teachers themselves struggle with this. Right? And oftentimes, teachers are faced not with behavioral problems, but what I call these existential dilemmas and questions. That teachers are forced with questions of meaning, questions of purpose. Why the hell am I here? What good is my work in this space? 
And without having a loving, supportive, vital community to foster and help one struggle and, re and respond to those questions, you get burnt out. You quit. And I want to do this any damn way. That's not helpful. So teachers themselves are forced to deal with the same kinds of issues that young people are dealing with. We don't learn that in graduate schools of education. If, if questions of meaning are what faces our, is what we face in our classroom, questions of meaning are what we face in our schools, where do teachers go to learn to respond and support teachers, support young people? We, can, we didn't have an answer to that question, but we knew that teachers were struggling with it. We knew that teachers were struggling with it. They just called it out. One of my, one of my things. We didn't know what to do. So in Oakland, we, they brought a, a few of us together and said, how do we support students at different, or teachers at certain schools that are dealing with some of these issues, man? We need a professional development. And I said to them, you don't need a professional development. And I refuse to do a professional development with these teachers to answer these questions. Because a professional development suggests that your most effective way of working with young people are through your profession, and not as a human being. Not your whole being, right? And so if I develop you as a teacher, I still disregard and disconnect you from the rest of your humanity. So we said, we're not going to do professional development. We want to locate 20 of the teachers who are dealing with this. And rather than us coming in at 4.30 or 4 o'clock after school and doing a one-hour professional development and giving them some handouts to study and giving them the four points of profound curriculum, blah, 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 we said to them that if you really want to address this issue, give us the resources to do the following. First, we need to remove them from the environment. So we did a retreat. We did a retreat. We identified 20. If you're familiar with Northern California, we went up to Sonoma, the wine country. Damn it. I took a plan. We went up to the wine country, a nice retreat. We didn't even talk about how to teach. It's not what we talked about. What we talked about is their child. Tell me about your child. <coughs> we talked about is what, is what was your favorite game you like to play when you were a child? We got our play on, we started playing with them. We got our Lincoln Law, and they played with them. Right? We also talked about what was challenging in your childhood, what's challenging in your environment right now. We had a space for them to talk about the ways in which the schools enacted trauma on them. Right? To name that reality. And so we, we talked about a lot of different things over the weekend, but more importantly, what we did is we found, we, we created a cocoon of hope for these teachers. The 20 of them, after we had this retreat, miraculously, we didn't have any plans for follow-up, right? Not real follow-up, we would visit them in their classrooms. But what they did is they decided to meet every, uh, every third Saturday, and they met every third Saturday at a church for the next year. And they required me to come. I said, I didn't even follow this. <laughs> but it was, the space was not important for them for just their teaching. Their, their, that the space was important for them for their own human development, which then had a greater impact on their teaching. Some of them said, because I went through this, I understand why I'm here now. Because I removed all the stuff that I was dealing with as a child, I'm in a better space to love the children that I'm working with now. It's a different way to think about how to make adults more effective with loving young people. My friend Jeff Duncan Andrade, I always, um, we always sort of go back and forth. And I, I, I was asked a question at ARA one time, and it got me thinking. I asked him the same question. And I said, can you, the question to me after this one of my talks, I said, can you train or teach people to love and care about kids? Good question, huh? Can you teach it? Can you train somebody how to love children? And when I thought about it, I, nobody trained me how to love my baby, not my son. Nobody trained you how to love your children. That wasn't a training moment. And so what I learned is not about training somebody. It's about allowing someone to love. Because we all are human. 
And as long as we stuff ourselves into the category of teaching, we limit the rest of our human capacity to embrace and love young people in ways that we've been put here to do. Nobody becomes a teacher to become mean-spirited. You don't, be, you don't go into teaching because of that. You go into teaching because you think you can make a change. But sometimes the environments and the schools cheat you up. They make you resent. And so these spaces that we create, we call this, um, I don't have pictures of the retreat, but we call it you know, black space because they're all out here teaching. Because part of it was their blackness was unaffirmed. Right? Their blackness was under assault. They couldn't say the word black without being, well, why is that black student you? And so we created an environment where they could be black and be proud and not apologize for being black. And so all of these kinds of spaces, I think, are important to rethink and reimagine the kinds of strategies we need. So if we define hope, Right. Snyder is a social psychologist, developed what I thought, what I think is really interesting. He called it hope theory. And essentially, if we boil the hope theory down, it says that there are really three ingredients to hope. The first ingredient is future goal orientation. That, that not only young people, but teachers need to have a future to see themselves in the future. What is it that you want to become? What is it that you want to achieve? What is it that you want to um, develop? And so the first thing is an orientation to becoming. The orientation to becoming. Not that we've achieved it, but an orientation to becoming it. Whatever it is. The second is pathways. That, that means that we have to think about how we build opportunities. So it's not just how we want to do it, but how do we build real opportunities for young people to have pathways to, to, to whatever they want to achieve. And then the third is a sense of agency that I can do it. Right? The sense that there's a capacity to act in courageous ways to achieve that. In Oakland, I shared with the graduate students here that we created a, a project that I studied. And the project is called Intergenerational Organizing. And the project is a, is a group of about 50 African American men. And there are a, a group that's 70 and above, and those are the elders. There's another group that's 40 and above, and that's my group, we call ourselves the Brotherhood. There's a group that's 20 and above, and they call those the, the warriors. And the beauty of this group is that they want to create hope for young African American girls and boys in Oakland. And so the way that we do that is, first, the elders have a role in creating hope. And their role is to create pathways because these elders, see, they ran this, they, they run foundations in Oakland. So one of them uh, was the assistant to the mayor. They know all, the, they have access to the resources. So their job is to clear the way, clear the pathways, because they can get meetings that I cannot. They can get money that I cannot. Then the next generation, the brotherhood, our job is to follow the direction of the elders. Not our meetings, they say, Sean, what we want you to do is develop a uh, we want you to develop an opportunity for every African American young person in this city to go to college or to experience a rites of passage. So our job is to do the thinking about the ways that we align systems and coordinate community-based organizations and build relationships with schools and community-based organizations. Our job is the thinking part of this strategy. Elders do the resources, we do the thinking. The warriors. Their job is to be on the ground. They're in the classrooms. Um, some, of me, some of you may be familiar with Chris Chapman's organization, the African American Male Achievement Initiative. Right? Many of those teachers in the classroom are our warriors. Right? They're in front of the young people every single day. And our job as a collective in this intergenerational network is to stay connected and talking and struggling with each other right? and commit to building these opportunities for hope. My, my friend Jeff Duncan and Johnny, in this really great article that was published in Harvard Interview, talks about three types of hope. Material hope, right? the sense that we can transform the, mat the material conditions of our neighborhoods and our schools and communities. Socratic hope, which is getting young people to critically think about their own role in justice and change. And then the last is audacious hope which is healing from oppression in order to transform it. Right? 
And I think it's um, audacious hope that's closely aligned with this notion of radical healing that we'll talk about in a second. The, this is a, a PowerPoint note, but I did it anyway. So I want you to read it. You right? <laughs> never supposed to put more than uh, five words of text, but I put on the damn paper. Because I want to read it. And that is youth development and civic engagement strategies designed to engage America's most disconnected young people globally successful to the extent that they address <coughs> hopelessness and create opportunities to heal social toxic environments and social violence. That we have to place healing at the center of our strategies if we want to be effective and we want to work with young people. So I want to share a metaphor, this metaphor with you. Uh, I was playing with this idea with a friend of mine who is actually a botanist. She studies plants at UC Berkeley. And I was telling her about you know, I think schools need to be more like, like nurseries, right? It's not schools are not learning environments, they're nurseries. You know, and, uh, the purpose of the nursery is to foster plants and grass. She said, you know what, I have, we used to do that at UC Berkeley. She said, we used to take these plants and we used to put them in these chambers and we used to pump toxic gas into these chambers and we used to basically watch how long it would take for the plant to die. We would measure its metabolism, we would measure um, how the plant died, what died first in the plant. And then she said, one time what we did is we did the same thing, but instead of using individual plants, we, co we, we created a colony or a community of plants. And we put these plants in the same chamber, and we actually pumped the same gas into the chamber. But rather than dying, the plants did something miraculous the plants began to emit different nutrients out of the soil. And they began to metabolize those nutrients in different ways. And the plants began to emit a gas in the chamber and clean up the gas, that, the toxic gas that was pumped into it. They detoxified the environment that was being poisoned. They worked in community to take something out of nothing, to transform it into something where the plants could thrive. And I thought that that was a really important, profound analogy to the kind of environment we need to be thinking about in our schools, in our neighborhoods. How do we create those environments where plants, where young people can thrive like plants? And I call that process radical healing. And so I wanted to study how radical healing is being practiced in schools or being practiced in neighborhoods where it seems like there's nothing that can be done. And so the study that we did took three years. And I'm going to just kind of run through this really quick. The first is we wanted to look at the purpose of several organizations that we had heard about that are using methods that are unconventional but seem to be doing some, uh, making some changes. We talked to lots of principals. We talked to lots of teachers. We identified 24 respondents, and these are people who are actually engaged in different kinds of radical healing strategies. The second thing is that we did is ethnographic profiles of the environments in which they were working. Right? We didn't want to just hear what they did. We needed to understand the neighborhood. We needed to understand the school. We needed to be able to describe and explain the textured reality of what it felt like in walking into a school that says walk only on the red tape. Or when the bell rings, you know, four times, stand still. Right? We wanted to understand that process. We wanted to um, develop a rich description of the environment. And so we looked at organizations, we looked at neighborhoods, and we looked at schools. And so in the book, you'll see examples of not just schools, but community-based organizations that are doing really profound and interesting practices. The third um, phase of the development um, of the project Focused on these in-depth interviews. And the in-depth interviews, some of them were more like focus groups, um, some of them were one-on-one, -on -one. but we wanted to not only understand what they did, we only wanted to understand their rationale. Like why did you do it? How did you get to this? And then the third phase is our analysis. And I'm going to skip this. This is just this is the kind of data that we're going to do. So what we found was really three types of what I call, and I struggle with using the term, right? I wanted to call it relational policy or relational practices. So my wife was sort of reading this. She said, well, why don't you just call it what they call it? They call it love. 
That's what they called it. Everyone we spoke to called what they did with the other is love. And so we found really three kinds of love that transformed the school environment, transformed the neighborhood, or transformed the organizations that they're working in. Relational love, restorative love, and political love. So the, the first case study takes place in Richmond, California. Richmond, California has the highest murder and homicide rate anywhere in California per capita. The homicide rate had gotten so, um, uh, so high that they knew that hiring more police officers wasn't the only solution, that they needed other kinds of solutions. And the city didn't know what to do. They called a friend of mine, his name is uh, Devon Bowen, who's a brilliant youth development practitioner uh, that understood this notion that in order to change the environment, that no matter what the environment was like, he had to have a loving relationship with young people. So he went, when they had called the road, he said, we want you to lower the murder rate, the homicide rate in Richmond. He said, I will do that if you allow me to do it the way that I know how to do it. And they said, well, how do you want to do it? He said, well, I want to hire um, former criminals that were in prison themselves, use tax dollars to pay for their salaries, and allow them to hang out on the corner with the young men who shoot people. Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> you didn't hear what I said. Y'all didn't hear me. So, this is the office, mayor's office in Michigan. He said, I want to use taxpayers' dollars to hire former criminals, felons, former drug dealers, to hang out on the corner with other people who've done the same thing. And of course, they did what you did. They're like, get the hell out of here. But I thought you were serious. He said, if you do this, I guarantee you in four years we'll see the homicide rate. And so the first person he hired was Joe. Joe had spent time in prison. He was himself uh, a, a drug dealer and knew he was in the crime. But when he came out, he wanted to do something different with his life, and he didn't know quite what he did, what to do. So he went with the Bowen Bogans program called the Office of Neighborhood Safety. And they borrowed the SIP, the, uh, the ceasefire model. If you're not familiar with ceasefire, you should just check it out. But one of the profound findings of the ceasefire model in terms of violence is they found out that oftentimes when we think about homicides, there's a, just as a, we'll use a rough number here, let's say there's 100 homicides in any city. There's a perception that we have about those 100 homicides as being random and widespread. What the ceasefire model said is that there are probably 10 people who are responsible for 100 homicides. 10 people who were responsible for 100 homicides. They looked in Richmond and they narrowed it down to about 15. 15 young men carry guns and shoot each other and kill each other. Now, first of all, thinking about working with those 15 is a lot different than thinking about working with 150 or 200 young men. They were able to identify those 150, those 15, by people like Joe. Because Joe knows when I went to the first meeting at the Office of Neighborhood Safety, there had just been a homicide the night before. But when I walked into the meeting, it was like, what's up, doc? And they had paper around them, there was 10 of them, and they were talking about not what happened, but they were mapping their relationships with each of the young, of these young men in the community. They said, you know what happened? Because I think, I think Mark got a beef with, with, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with Benita last night. And Benita's boyfriend heard about it, and he came over to Joe's house, that's why he carried the gun. And they began to map these relationships. So he said, okay, well, if Benita's got a beef with Joe, then why don't we go over to Benita to find out what's going on? So they got in their car and they went over to Benita. Then they went over to Joe's. And they were able to use their relationships in ways that were able to intervene on potential kinds of violence. But how did they form those relationships? It's a question that I had. So I just hung out with them for a whole summer. And they took me on rides up North Oakland. We ran, we just rode around. And they hung out on the corners. Right? One of the, one of the, I asked him, I said, why does all seem to just be hanging out? And he said, you know what? If you are a shepherd and you don't smell like sheep, you ain't really a shepherd. I'll say it again. If you're a shepherd and you don't smell like sheep, 
That means you ain't been with no sheep. That means you ain't touched no sheep. That means you ain't spent no time with no sheep. So what they do is they see themselves as sheep because they spend time with the young men. That means where the young men? They're out of the corner. So they're out of the corner. But what they do is they, they develop these loving relationships. And he said, look, man, I know you, have, you want to get your driver's license. But before you go over and think about retaliating on somebody, why don't, why don't you let me help you get your driver's license? And then we go get some pizza. And guess what? The young men say, OK. Their philosophy is that the carrot has to be so much bigger than the stick. Right? The reward has to be so much bigger than the stick that it makes them wrestle with the choice of shooting someone or another alternative. Here's another carrot, they say. If you don't shoot anybody, 15 young men, for the next month, listen to me. If you don't shoot anybody for the next month, we're going to take all of you to South Africa. The carrot has to be so much bigger than the stick that it makes them wrestle with a choice. They didn't say don't shoot anybody. They did not say don't shoot anybody. They, they just wanted them to wrestle with them. Guess what? They didn't shoot anybody. And they took all 15 to South Africa. Their philosophy is that through these relationships, right, because they're able to form these loving relationships, one of the things they say after their, every interaction with the young men is they say, yo man, you know I love you, right? And the young man first kind of go, what? <laughs> he said, I love you. And after a while, they go, yeah man, I love you too. Or I got love for you, bro. That's how they say it. I got love for you, bro. But the, but the men, the young men in the office they have been sick and say, I love you. And, what, and it may seem weird, but they're a, what they're able to do is take that relationship and then they can leverage it into the kind of behavior that they want to see. So rather than trying to just enforce a particular kind of behavior, they use their relationship to leverage it in ways that have the kind of outcomes that they want to see. And as a result of that, this is the homicide rate. The program started in 2009. And you can see in 2014, the homicide rate had dropped to lower than 15. It's an effective program. It's an example of how we think about developing a sense of policy from the bottom. It's through these relationships that they're able to transform their environments. Restorative love. I'm going to kind of go fast because I probably don't know how much time I have. I'm going to go fast past this one. So, if you ever come to San Francisco, there's an organizer, his brother, his name is Rudy Corpus. Rudy Corpus, just like Joe, you know Rudy? Um, Rudy Corpus was, um, he did probably 10 years in San Quentin. He was a notorious gang brother. Um, when he got out, he wanted to transform his life. He wanted to work to organize young people in San Francisco uh, in ways to improve their the neighborhoods and schools. But something happened in September 2014. The young people at his, his youth center um, had created a mural. This is a picture of the mural. Beautiful mural. This is a huge building. But a, a graffiti artist, or a tagger, had came and tagged the entire front part of the mural. Destroyed it. So Rudy woke up that morning with a phone call from his program that one of the people worked in the program called United Place. He said, Rudy, man, you got to come down here, man. They, talk, they tagged our, 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 our mural. So he went down there and he saw the mural. He said, when I saw it, bro, I wanted to cry. But the second emotion I had was revenge. Because my old woman kicked in, man. My first thing is I wanted is to break the guy's arms, have my friends take pictures of it. He was serious. He said, old Rudy was back. But I had to wrestle with it. And not only was old Rudy back, all of the adults in his space wanted him to do the same thing. Let's get him, Rudy. The young people were like, look, man, we're trying to be violent free, man, but I understand. Because <laughs> they just did, they just did this. Rudy was able to actually find out who did it. He called him up. He said, man, um, look, I know you did this. You got to repair it. He said, look, man, the guy who did it had left town because he knew Rudy was looking for him. He was in Hawaii. He left. Rudy said, look, man, um, I want you to know if you come back to San Francisco, if you see me first, you won't be touched. You won't be harmed. I can guarantee you that. If you don't come see me first, I can't say much. But if you come see me first, I can guarantee you won't be hard. The guy was like, man, struggling. He got family in San Francisco. He goes back to San Francisco and shows up at the club one morning, 
Uh, actually, one afternoon, one of the young people there. He walks up to Rudy and he says, Hey, I'm so and so. I'm the guy who tagged over your thing. And Rudy said, Okay, we're going to have a community meeting. And all the young people and all the staff sat in this meeting. And Rudy said to the, the, uh, the young man, he asked him to speak. He said, You know, I know I tagged over the wrong mural. And Rudy said, You know what? You tagged over the right mural. Because Rudy had seen something in a video, there was a video. And as he watched the guy paint, he noticed the guy was drunk. He was completely inebriated, right? And Rudy had gone through recovery himself as an alcoholic. So he knew the guy that painted over the mural needed help. And so Rudy said, you didn't paint over the right mural, the wrong mural, brother. You painted over the right mural. We're here to help you. We're here to restore you, right? And I want you to know, Rudy said this in public, I want you to know I forgive you for what you did. And what that did is that the, the young man that painted over it was in pain, not only for fear of what's going to happen to him, but pain for other stuff in his life. He began to cry in front of all these young, these, these young people. But what it said to the young people is it's reestablished the group's commitment to forgiveness. It reestablished a different way of engaging and relating and working in the community. And it provided a healing that was necessary for that group to move forward. Uh, Rudy, from that, was able to um, establish a restorative practice of the guy had to pay once a month. But that story made its way to uh, the mayor's office. So the city of San Francisco is now looking at different ways, um, different ways to use restorative practices in their program. The third and final example is called political love. And political love is, this is a challenging picture. You know, I'll just kind of ride with you. This is a neighborhood called Bayview Hills Point, San Francisco. Y'all know Bayview Hills Point? Very similar to Richmond. Bayview Hills Point again has high homicide rates. This is a picture of what young people do when they get bored. They burn, they just burn the, some of the playground. Right? They get bored. But Bayview Hills Point has a high homicide rate. A friend of mine, named name is Lena Miller, um, research-wise, I should say, just in terms of methodology, that everybody's name I'm using, they told me to name them in my book. Right, so I don't use no anonymous bullshit. Right? They were like, they're like, name me. I said this. I want you to name me. I'm like, wait. Okay. So, I just want to say that because I know there's research. Right? So, um, Blair Miller, who was the executive director of Hunters Point Family, had a trauma, traumatic experience. One of the community workers that worked with young people was shot and killed in Baker Hunters Point. Now, unlike the other ch ch challenges. Traumas, right? When young people are killed daily, ongoing, right? So it's not post-traumatic stress disorder. Right? The term that we use is called persistent traumatic stress environment. And it's nothing post about it. And they call it post-traumatic stress disorder presumes that the disorder rely is exists in the individual. And in fact, the disorder exists in the environment in which the individual is forced to live. And so later, it's said she couldn't take it anymore. One of her own employees, someone that she loved and grew up with her, was shot and killed. And so she went into deep depression and decided to leave the organization. She came to me and my wife who worked with uh, these organizations, and we were able to create a sabbatical for her, where she was able to just kind of leave and get some time off. But what she did from that sabbatical is she revived herself. And she, she said to me, when she came back, that what that sabbatical forced her to do is reimagine her work. Hunter's Point family was really an after school program. They worked with young people in, these, in different schools. And she said, what we really need, Sean, in making Hunter's Point is to saturate our community with healing opportunities. So her job, she reimagined her role in the community. So when she went back to Hunter's Point family, she began to say, well, what would it look like to reimagine and to saturate our neighborhood with healing opportunities? So she's an organizer. So she began to ask young people and residents of the Hunters Point family. And they said things like, we don't want mental health. We want yoga. We want contemplative practices and meditation. We want um, opportunities to get massages. We want clean places to listen and smell incense and relax. We want all the things that happen in the hills that people get that we don't have. We have a right to well-being. Well-being is not a privilege, it's a right. 
to relax, to have access to joy and possibility. So she began to organize, and she worked with some students in San Francisco State and UC San Francisco. And they produced a map that was helpful in their organizing. The red map, the red part of this map, represents the mental health need in San Francisco. This is where disproportionate amounts of trauma exist. On this point is this area here called Region 10. The white dots represent where the dollars are being spent by the city and the state of California for mental health and wellness services. You see the gap. So she knew immediately from this piece of evidence that the dollars and the resources to create saturating experiences for healing were, were not going to be possible if the resources were being spent in places where there was no need. So her job was to, she said, our goal was to move the white dots. Like if the red areas are the infection, then the white dots would be the medicine. And so her goal was to move the white dots to saturate the communities in these, in these areas. I'm going to skip past this. Right? right now, the city of San Francisco was able to transfer approximately $2 million into this effort. It's still not complete yet. But her organizing effort was an example of how her political love for the community was able to transfer resources into a place where it was most needed. So I want to end here with a quote from Dr. King that I think ties together this notion of radical healing that sort of combines this notion of justice with our understanding of love. And he says that one of the greatest problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have usually been contrasted as opposites. What is needed is a realization that without uh, what is needed is a realization that, that power without love is reckless and abusive. And that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. Thank you very much, Jesus.